because of the high likelihood of uh, or better chances of being first in my class in <laughs> yeah. the school of geology. Yeah, but if you weren't first in your class, you were last. You were about last, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of, um, <laughs> well, a lot of the people that were like a part of my class, they were either grad students that were in my classes or older undergrads. Mm. So doing like one class a semester type thing, like a longer a longer track than you had, yeah, yeah. makes sense. Because if you if you failed a class, you basically postponed your graduation by a year. Ugh, yeah. So it was it was stressful. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Sorry, that was like a really long. That's no, okay. That's because we jumped in and asked questions yeah. and stuff. That's cool. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. Do you have a second? We have time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We have plenty of time. <laughs> um, hi everyone, I'm Sebastian Martinez. I am a data logger and Super. ocean science yep, intern. Coming in. Sorry, go ahead. Ocean science um, intern with the Nautilus. Um, I go to, I'm a, also an undergraduate researcher at University of Hawaii at Manoa in their deep sea fish ecology lab. Um, to answer your question, I do think I had very different thoughts of where I would be as a kid compared to a high school high schooler as well. Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, I did always did know when I go into marine science that kind of process of what type of marine science has definitely changed over time. Um, as a kid, I was very much interested in studying um, symbiotic relationships in around seven to eight years old, particularly reef. Um, symbiotic relationships. Think like um, gobies and blind pistol shrimp in shallow water reefs. Um, going into high school though, I was far more interested in coral ecology and aquaculture. Um, so I thought I was going to go into coral aquaculture. But um, definitely different from where I am now at studying deep sea seamount ecosystems as more of an interdisciplinary oceanographer than specifically a marine biologist. Cool. Can I also have you share a little bit about, have you been on Nautilus before? I have. Yeah, tell us about it. Um, Nautilus is actually what changed me over to deep sea environments. Um, right out of high school in 2013, uh, I was able to join Nautilus as an honors research program mm -hmm. student, which at the time was a high school program built to give a bit of a smorgasbord of duties here on the Nautilus. So I got to do some of the data logger work. I got to do some of the seafloor mapping work and some of the education work. Um, so I got a little bit of a taster of everything and could see all aspects of deep sea exploration with OET as kind of a whole. Um, but yeah, I went to the Vaughn Dam hydrothermal event fields in the Mid Cayman Rise, um, which was very influential to changing me over to deep sea because I got to see a huge amount of diversity in areas that I wouldn't initially think there would be. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll be honest, like uh, when I was younger and I was growing up and I really wanted to like study the ocean, like. Um, a lot of me kind of felt like it wasn't something that was maybe attainable or possible for me. So I kind of just like, you know, allowed myself to change my mind. But I just think about all the people that are viewing Nautilus right now and hearing about all these different opportunities that they can have to get on board and explore with us. And it makes me so happy. And I know I have some of my students that might be watching. Um, so I'm just so grateful for this space and that um, Nautilus makes opportunities for people to come aboard and sail for the first time, but also that people can just kind of tune in and just explore with us even from home or wherever. Nice. Is anyone on our front row ready for an introduction? Uh, I could go ahead. Cool, uh, thank you. Good morning, this is Derek Sowers, um, the navigator on this watch, and uh, I work for the Ocean Exploration Trust as a mapping operations manager. Um, yeah, I think I don't think I could have really predicted this job. I mean, right now, getting my employer is telling me to go to one of the largest marine protected areas, the largest one in the United States, one of the largest in the world, and map things for the first time and see the kind of things we're seeing. I mean, it's unbelievable. So I still can't believe, really, that I have the opportunity to do this particular job, but certainly always pictured picture myself doing something with 
exploration, nature, conservation. So I feel like right at home here. Do you guys want to do an all stop and look at this closer or keep moving? Or? Is that a sure. yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> Bridge now. All right, I'm wondering whether or not we should take a, a Niskin, here, given please. that this is an unusual spot of coral yeah. density on this yeah. dive. I don't think, um, so I, the last watch didn't sample at all. I don't know if the first watch got any. They sampled a Niskin and they sampled a rock. Okay. And they did a Niskin in the, what we've been seeing normally so far. Okay. So this might be a good spot. Uh, yeah. We may want to think about like stepping back if we're going to. Yeah, definitely still be in that three to we'll meter range of the sea floor. The day. Okay. End up dragging us off the spot if we end up staying here. 25 meters. Yeah, maybe a 20 meter step back. Okay. Anything in particular on here? You wanna uh, so once we're like set up with, um, you know, the ship isn't pulling us around, we do want to get like two meters over uh, sort of the corals and do a Niskin. Okay. Um, I don't know if any of this is um, sort of the, the sort of stuff that we want to be sampling, so probably just the Niskin unless um, Sebastian determines otherwise. Bridge, nap. I don't see anything in particular that stands out. Yeah. Um, Asako is here. Um, if she can, Asako, you can, tune it, you can one, chime three, in if zero. you do think there's anything to sample, but so far, I'm Thank just you. seeing a higher density of cor the same uh, corals that we've been seeing please. so far. Okay. Just in some heavier amount of hemichoralliums. I know that we didn't finish our introductions, but Hannah, can you tell us a little bit about these rocks and like the features that we were looking at a moment ago? Yeah, because I literally just wrote a note about them because I was like, they're so cool because so far, like, we went by two rock formations in the basalt that are kind of like ridge-like and showing the lines. It reminds me of the Pahoy Hoy. Mm -hmm. And it's just really interesting. And I, I, don't, I don't know why it's the sheet or low bait flow is looking like that. It's so cool. But yeah, that, that, I, I noticed it and I was like, whoa. Because I haven't seen that yet. And I was like, I'll start drawing. And even though like, what, so what are you <laughs> up to over there on the iPad? Are you just drawing rock? Fiction, well, or are you highlighting, like you're looking at textbooks and notes and stuff? Uh, yeah, so I have like textbook pages that are open. Oh. And then I also, I try to keep track of what the rocks look like at, on uh -huh. like before each waypoint or along the waypoint. So just mm -hmm. to like have an idea if there's like, a, a, I'm gonna like look back on it and mm -hmm. see if there's like a similar pattern to any of them. But, uh, yeah, and then I always try to take notes whenever Val's on watch because she just like constantly drops knowledge and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I started like taking notes drops like, knowledge. so um, like last <laughs> night she was saying how this seamount, it overlaps, this seamount overlaps with the Hawaiian change mm -hmm. and the chain that we think our, the hotspot we're looking at formed. So it was either this seamount could have been like 20, 28 million to 25 to 28 million years old mm -hmm. if it's part of the Hawaiian seamount chain. And then it would be, or if it was part of the Cretaceous, it would be 80 to 100 million years ago. And when she yeah, got down, back even further. Okay. when she further. got down to the seafloor, she was saying how based on looking at the manganese Bridge, yeah. crust of these rocks, mm -hmm. that it's probably during the Cretaceous. But obviously we won't know unless we like get good samples and can collect ages, but that's that's what she said so far. So I thought that was interesting, so I wrote that down. So mm -hmm. I would have wrote that down too, that is interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I try to like constantly, like just listen to her, cause she just like, 
again, she's just so smart, so knowledgeable. Yeah, one of the things I want to highlight about this experience is just, um, you know, everyone has brought, um, you know, their knowledge and their expertise with them and their particular field or interest. And uh, this has been like such an incredible learning space. Like, I feel like everyone is learning so many different things. And um, I think that's really special. And I'm excited to see so many people learning. And I'm trying to figure out like how to you know, bring that excitement for just learning new things and trying new things back home to my students. Yeah, so just an update. Um, because we are moving along pretty quickly, yeah. you have to step the ship back and no swing the yeah. goes back towards the coral. So. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll, pop, we'll do a Niskin. Um, we'll probably get some zooms on the coral to just confirm, but um, what Asako's saying so far is that we're in, um, we're still in a, a bamboo forest zone that I guess we've been documenting. So it's not like, um, it's not a unique sort of area yet that we may want to spend more time in. But yeah, stopping the ship is fine for getting the Niskin. And it's it's good because the only other one that they've got in this dive was in an area that was kind of like barren of it or devoid of any corals. So this will be different. Sounds good. Okay, while we're here, Jake, can you do an introduction? Is this a good time? <coughs> sure. Uh, I am, or how did I get into this? That's the question, right? I uh, yes. kind of stumbled into ROV piloting, but growing up, I was definitely interested in space and working out in the water and also, like, you know, taking things apart, fixing things. Um, but like every other New Englander, I also wanted to be like Tom Brady. <laughs> and uh, play football, so that was a big driver in my early years. Um, and then uh, came came into college and started studying engineering, and uh, just knew I wanted to work around the water. Uh, and then ended up getting into um, ocean engineering, and uh, it's <clears throat> kind of a field that studies mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and. Uh, my mom sent me this internship link, and I hadn't done anything with ROVs or robots, and I ended up just going for it. And I knew as soon as I got that internship, or as soon as I came out here, I was like, this is what I want to do. It's, uh, it's fun, it's exciting, and uh, allows me to be on the water and uh, do some uh, things that, I don't know, I, I envisioned doing when I was younger, like almost going to space. It's one of the closest parallels to going to space. Stuff like that. I bet your mom never lets you forget that either. Nope, nope, she never does. <laughs> what uh, what year was your internship? Uh, 2000, 2019. Okay, cool. Summer, summer 2019. Was that the uh, Samoa, Pongo, Pongo, and Apia year? Yes. That was a year, yeah. It wasn't that expedition, though, because I don't think it was. I'm going to... So... Doesn't look like we're making any headway backwards right now. Okay. And if this is just for a Niskin, I may. I, yeah. I don't know. I may <laughs> recommend moving on. This is going to take quite yeah, some time. Yeah, I think that's fine. We can move and on. I think yeah, that's that, fine. That and wasn't. I think if we're if we're planning on making any stops like this moving forward, we might it might just make more sense to move at a slightly slower speed. Yeah, we weren't. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you think 0 0.3 would be slow enough to be able to call an all stop and not overshoot so much? Yeah, we just have to be really preemptive if we're going to move fast and, yeah, and then stop like that. We can't, like, you know, even just smelling the roses for a second and then calling a stop. Atalanta has about 30 to 35 meters of swing at this depth. I'm just checking it ahead, yeah. Sounds good.
bridge now. Could we please do a move five zero meters bearing three four zero at zero point two knots. Uh, three four zero. Yes, thank you. Three four zero. Are you continuing the move? I'm just trying to get back up here more. Okay, I gotta get back under Hercules before. I mean, um, Atlanta before we start moving ahead again. Still getting pulled around. Is that still Paul up on the bridge? Yeah. Sounds like Paul. Sounded a little different. Yeah, he's up. Bridge nav. Sorry, if we could uh, delay that move about a minute or two, or a couple minutes, I'll let you know when we can move. Um, yes, please. Sorry about that. Uh, it's all right. Thanks, Jake, for sharing all of that. I had definitely pressed a button on my panel back here and was trying to figure out how to uh, get back to my original settings um, so I couldn't unmute. But I love hearing that story, and I love hearing about how you found out about the internship and all the opportunities it brought you. So anyone else who's interested in that field, contact Jake's mom, and she'll get you <laughs> hooked up. She'll find you some good yeah. ones. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Tito, what about you? Is this a good time? Oh, I think you might be muted right now. Uh, um, maybe his mic's far away. Oh. Try that. No, push down on the SPL button. So you're, there you How's go. Now you've got a hot mic. All right. Uh, Tito Colacious. I grew up in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Oh. Uh, my father was a sailor, and there was never much doubt about where I'd head off to to find work. But uh, at 17, yeah. I quit high school, joined the Navy. Got out at 20, and on very short notice, I was dragged off the beach and sent to the Azores to get on the RV Nora as a mess attendant, and we found the, uh, the Titanic, which uh, surprised the heck out of me, but also exposed me to all kinds of interesting facets of uh, maritime work, and spent the next 15 years doing everything I could to learn everything I could about that kind of stuff, and in 2000 started working with ROVs. And, uh, I guess what I would say the most is that I could never have dreamt this job up when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Tito, you left the junior off your name this time. Oops. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm actually a third, which makes filling out any form anywhere difficult. Yeah. I was a. Uh my dad's a junior and they were like, no, we're just going to give you uh, the first name as your middle name because they didn't want to do that to me. Yeah. Yeah, especially the modern era, like most yeah. systems don't know how to deal with it. So you end up with a boarding pass that has your last name and then <laughs> three, a capital I, lowercase I, lowercase I <laughs> appended to the end of it, like no space. So and so I, uh, then your passport doesn't match and... Uh, but if I say Tito, I never say Junior. If I say Alberto, I oh, typically do. Oh, okay. okay. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Which it's a nickname. Yeah. I was uh, uh, super lucky. My grandfather, when he was 12, uh, kind of well-to-do back in the day, uh, was presented with a pocket watch from his, uh, by his parents that they got at Bailey, Banks, and Biddle in Philadelphia. And they had engraved on the inside back uh, as a gift to him with his name. And uh, my dad years ago passed that down to me. And, you know, it's just, we have the same name, so it's kind of cool. Uh, still trying to figure out where, who I'm going to hand that down to. Maybe my nephews. <laughs> nice. I love that, Ed. Uh, 
Do you want to share a little bit about yourself and how you got here and where you thought maybe you were going to be? Sure. Um, so I'm Ed McNichol. I'm the video operations manager for OET and I'm sailing as the second video engineer. Um, I, my career was focused uh, for I do some at 25, 30 years on uh, core uh, film and television production and broadcasting. Uh, and uh, like, I think it was Mike uh, at age eight got bit by that bug uh, and just at, was in my core and knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then in 2005, I was lucky enough when I worked at a university to support a deep sea mission uh, and then in 2010, went to sea for the first time, and it just went bonkers from there. Uh, so yeah, I was I was fortunate that I kind of knew what I wanted to do. Um, the uh, uh, interesting thing is when you hear, I mean, I could be totally wrong about this. Watch me set this up and be so wrong. When you hear like what we do, there's no way any of us could tell somebody that. Like it's a very American thing to do when you meet somebody you say, oh, what do you do? And they're referring to your job, your work. And no matter what any of us says, like you can't just say to somebody sitting next to you on a plane, oh, I'm a marine archaeologist. And they never go, oh, okay. You're then being interrogated for the next hour and a half. Uh, you can't say, I'm an expedition leader for the RV Jason out of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and not get a million questions. So uh, I uh, have been known, because uh, I can't, if, even if I say I work on boats, oh, like fishing vessels? No, actually science vessels. Oh, what kind of science? I mean, it just goes on and on. And anyone who's on this boat is usually passionate about what we do and we're happy to share it. There's just some times where you're not so passionate about sharing, especially after maybe a 20 hour travel day. And so I will tell people I manage a plumbing warehouse. Uh, and nobody asks questions about that. And I have a friend who's an ROV pilot who says, tells people he drives forklifts. Uh, do you, any of you guys have a alter career that you use to dodge a million questions? I mean, not an alter career. Sometimes I'll just say marine environmental work if I don't want to go oh, into Oh, yeah. That sounds but like spills and stuff. Yeah. Sounds like, oh, yeah, but, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's at least mildly true. Right. <laughs> Unlike a plumbing warehouse, which I assume you don't own. No, no. <laughs> it's funny. I, I told my uh, dad this years ago, and he's like, of course you had to make yourself the manager. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm old. I can't, you know, that's going to be got more no, questions then. You, you work minimum wage hourly. There yeah. you go. Hot. Yep. <laughs> Loading dock. You're a cashier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually uh, uh, own a company now that specializes in uh, designing, building, and operating remotely operated vehicle control rooms and video systems. And there's no way you can say that and not get interrogated. Um, just to keep it on the radar that soon we'll be wanting to get a rock. Just, I don't know if we should wait to like. Well, so yeah, so Valid said after 2200. It didn't mean at 2200. So I think, yeah, maybe like, so we're pretty much. I mean, and so uh, just real quick before I answer that, uh, we don't need to like go as as the same as the last dives. We don't need to go directly over the waypoints. We can just kind of be near and keep going. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think we can keep moving, Derek, and just shift our heading once we, you know, just move on to, to waypoint four. Um, but yeah, I think if we can plan to maybe like three quarters of the way to waypoint four, like where those. Um, uh, isobaths start evening, uh, start getting wider. I think we could um, plan a ship stop for a uh, poke around at rocks and things. 
Does that, make, does that work for you guys? Yeah, Derek, right where your mouse is. Yep. Around that area. Okay, I'll just drop a place mark here for now. Okay, thank you. Sure. He's very good at that, putting the mouse exactly where he wanted know, it to be. I know, I <laughs> know. Are there dives where we want to stay, like directly over the waypoints as we go? Yeah, like, I mean, there wow. are some. So, I mean, this one is a little bit, so one. we're we're tracking along the very top of a ridge. So we don't want to go too far to either direction, but I mean, it's a, it's a pretty wide ridge. It's not like we're going to mm -hmm. fall off the edge. Um, you know, but we, we don't want to be like, completely making it up. But uh, there are some dives that it, that it, it matters more to go point to point because of sometimes it's that they've been dived before and we know where certain things are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's certain features that we need to hit along the way. But this one's just kind of like, you know, we're gonna just going to work along the top of the ridge. So it's kind of, you know, there's margin for error. Yeah, so I've been trying to stay kind of at the top yeah. of this steep part. Yeah, for sometimes sure. Sometimes you find more corals along the edges. Um, oh, cool, yeah. Smart. Basically just going sort of due west, and then we'll go yeah. north. Yeah. So, Mike, is there a portrayal of what you do in any film uh, <laughs> that is close to reality? I mean, we all know you're not Matthew McConaughey scuba diving down to a wreck somewhere, but... Although you do a lot of that. You do a lot of diving, I right? Just, yeah, I do. Maybe um, that... Is that the closest portrayal in film to what you actually do? Well, the problem is that... Any, almost any film that um, does that sort of stuff is they're looking for gold, which uh, is right. not right. something that we do. Um, so, not really. Um, I mean, let's see. Yeah, there, there's films like The Abyss where instead of being archaeologists, they're doing um, deep sea mining, which, you know, yeah. in the ha habitats that we haven't really developed yet, um, which are really cool movie um but yeah not really i mean they typically hollywood glorifies archaeology into either relic hunting like indiana jones or treasure hunting like um you know fool's gold or right the deep or whatever right. um i mean the nice thing about the deep is that they're just tourists who happen to stumble across something mm -hmm. rather than like they're seeking it out but uh yeah the, I, I, archaeologists don't really get um well, it's it, we we do adventures, but it's not as adventurous, for example, as as film may want it to be. So there, there's very few times where in a film where archaeologist is doing archaeology um, the way that it's done. I would it say it likes to be glorified. Yeah, I think for a lot of the my shipmates, uh, the portrayal of the technicians and engineers in Titanic in the modern day scenes. Yeah. They captured the kind of social and maybe quirkiness of my cohort fairly well. Not what we're actually doing for work, but just the... Yeah, I mean, I, that, that crossed my mind as well. Um, I mean, obviously they were in the movie, they're going after the, the jewels. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean that it, it's a the reason it's a pretty close representation of what we do is because they were actually in subs at the site, yeah. you know, and filmed it. So it's like I mean that's pretty much as close as you can get in Hollywood. Um, so I mean that's a decent representation of the methods. Um, still not the correct objective. Um, I, I really appreciate those scenes in the movie, and it's I mean obviously Cameron's very into subs and that sort of thing, but it's it's a lot of effort to get. A couple of establishing shots for right. setting the right. stage. Zoom here, I coming in. Like, I do. I re, I do like that movie actually. Uh, um, as mu as much as you know, the world kind of like became obsessed with Titanic in '97. I re actually still really like that movie. It's it's very I well done. Haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah, I rewatched it. Well, I rewatched it after this year's latest Titanic news. Yeah. But, um, right. You know, I just I was like, you know, I feel like I need to revisit some of these things. Um, there's, I don't know what it is about this work, but it seems to bring out people who, you know, their work is interesting, but everybody seems to have a facet of their lives that you're just like, wait, what? Um, at the start of most expeditions, we have a meeting of uh, all the personnel who are on board, and we do a round of introductions like this. And one time the expedition leader said, you know, tell us blah, blah, blah. 
and tell us uh, something interesting about yourself. And the first person who went, uh, went was an artist who was sailing with us from San Francisco. And she said, the most interesting thing about me is I was just scuba diving under the ice in Antarctica in a hot dog costume. <laughs> well, there you go. You can't and, really beat that. and that was it. The rest of us were like, nope, <laughs> can't compete. <laughs> but it's amazing. And just in the off hours, you talk to your shipmates and they're, you know, touring India playing the Indian cello or, you know, climbing a mountain somewhere. There's a lot of uh, wanderlust and the yeah. people that find their way to sea. Uh, no shortage of shipmates who don't have an address. You ask them, where are you, where are you going at the end of this expedition? They're like, well, Burma looks interesting. I love that. And actually, Tito, I never had a chance to go back and I think I was talking to you about one of your friends that you said was in space right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? that's correct. Yeah, that's uh, super okay. cool. Can I hear about that, please? I didn't have a chance to ask you again. Sure. Uh, so Laurel O'Hara uh, came to Woods Hole probably 12, 13 years ago, worked with the Alvin Group for three or four years, did a lot of the engineering on the... Uh, the upgrade to 6,500 meters on Alvin. And uh, once that was completed, started working with Jason for years and years. But uh, yeah, she got launched into space yesterday. I got to watch that. I was That's oh, wow. so just cool. amazed to watch her walk up the steps in her spacesuit. That's and uh, there were, I believe, representatives from Woods Hole at the launch. I don't know about that. I yeah, know they... her mom and dad and her sister were oh, all there. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. But she is an adjunct engineer at Woods Hole still. Nice. But she is spending six months on the space station. Wow. I was texting her on Wednesday and wishing her good luck <laughs> and trying to talk her into watching us explore Kaga. Oh, yeah. And is I that think Dumbo? she was a little busy, yeah. but uh, she Say was... Say again? Uh, is that Dumbo to the right? Dumbo? Of the little boulder? The little white thing? Yeah. Oh, I thought that, that was white a... That's a sponge, I think. I thought it was a sponge, too. Yeah, I think it's a sponge. It's a sponge. It's small. See the... Uh, Lasers. May I'm just yeah, have some full You it's want like, a quick zoom? But sure. Yeah, uh, those octopuses can actually be that small. That's a sponge. Yeah, that's a sponge. Coming out. Sorry. Cool sponge. Still cool sponge, just not Dumbo octopus. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that kind of thing that, like Tito, you have people in your life like that. The, you're like, oh, that's right. I do know somebody who just lifted off for the space station yesterday. Forgot all about that. But I had that's been uh, really texting cool. her on Wednesday from the <laughs> van and uh, trying to talk her into uh, tuning in for a little Kaga. Fishing, line? fishing gear? Uh, fishing gear? Yeah. The green? Looks like yeah, fishing gear. Yeah, that looks like a line. Go for zoom? Yeah, going in. I know it's got things coming off of it, though. Like net on yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Green the other line. way. Yeah. Oh yeah, there it is up top. Looks. Yeah, it's, there's bio growth on it. Yeah, that whole mess there. This looks like the kind of debris that would just kind of drift in to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess she was unable to watch uh, due to prior commitments. She was, but I did mention that uh, we would be the closest to her at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being in the middle of the ocean. Don't see too much green down here. It's one color you don't. No, it stuck out. It stuck out. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed when I go home and see like the lush <laughs> forest of New Hampshire. It's just so much green. A uh, crab. Sorry, it took me a while to pick that up. <laughs> yeah, so we're, I mean, according to the topo map here, we're right along the edge of where this, to the left, it drops off steeply. And to the right, it's, you know, just kind of going gently up contour. Yeah, I think, unless anyone, I, th I think just tracking a line up to that way, the look for rock waypoint would, would be fine. Don't want to explore the edge. <laughs> I mean, 
What, uh, Sebastian, what do you think? Can you repeat? Uh, does it matter if we work along the edge or if we just track a straight line? Um, I don't think there's going to be too much of a major change. So whatever works for you guys. Squat. It seems like we are seeing more coral than the track line before okay. our watch. Yeah, so let's... um. Might be more food coming Yeah, if up. you just want to work pretty much directly west and then up, that yeah. works too. Okay. I could speed up if you like a little bit. I just don't want to go too, too fast because when we do stop, it's hard to hold speed. Yeah, well, I mean, it seems like that look for rock will be a plan to stop, so we can kind of do whatever we want speed-wise up until that point because we'll have our own heads up. Cool. Did anyone have a chance to look at the stars before you came in the control van this morning? Yeah. Sarah texted me and said, like, apparently it's, like, I keep forgetting. Amazing. I was, I think one of the reasons I was, fell asleep as soon as I hit the, hit the, my head hit the bed or pillow <laughs> was we went to go look at the stars and it was insane. It was oh. crazy. It was the first time that I, I noticed the, like, Milky Way lines. Yeah. And, um... Yeah, Jupiter was moving super fast. Really? Yeah, but Jupiter, at first when we got there, it was like around like 10.30, and it was like right at the horizon line, and then by the time we left, it was like 11.40 something. It was like Fish. moving, moving on. <laughs> Going in, I need holding. to spend more time up there. Red tail. Strangely enough, even on a super clear night out here, a laser pointer still works and works really well to, like if you're trying to describe uh, a part of the sky or a star to somebody, you can highlight it with a laser pointer. I usually bring one, but I did not dislike. Right. Come Coming out. Um, our... Uh, Hawaiian shipmates, some of them have gone by traditional canoe up into parts of the monument and uh, do that by celestial navigation. That's so impressive. So tonight's moon um, is Hilo, which is a new moon. The word Hilo has three meanings. Hilo is a famous Hawaiian navigator. Um, Hilo can also mean twisted or braided. And Hilo is the first night of the new moon. So, meaning you can't really see it. So the Hawaiian lunar calendar, really important, even for um, kind of helping us understand when is a good planting season, when is a good time to fish, where it's good to fish. So um, our ancestors really relied on this, you know, monthly lunar cycles um, after deep observation over generations to see what's going on in the environment. So Hilo Moon. So it's a good stargazing. Mm -hmm. What was the name? I think Mahina told me about a website or an app um, oh, that would like, send you messages oh. about the moon phase. Yeah, I, it's a Mahina calendar. I don't yeah. know the exact like website. Yeah. But they were amazing. I used to have the app, and they mm -hmm. would send daily updates. Mm -hmm. But now you have to um, pay, pay which it, is, yeah. you know, that's you need people need to make money. <laughs> yeah. Because they're 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 dropping a lot of yeah. EK bombs. Yeah. Like knowledge bombs. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. they should get um, compensated. 
I'll look it up and share with it. Okay. Share you with I everybody. Meant to, I had looked it up previously, and then. It's funny, a lot of the, um, like the sky viewing apps, obviously need to know your location. Yeah. And uh, most devices have a hard time. They rely too much on uh, internet connection to know your location, so. Yeah. Yeah. And most of the time, it bounces around, but I don't know if you guys have noticed, but uh, if you connect online and go to a store somewhere, have you noticed that the price, it just says P and then a bunch of numbers? Seen no, that? I haven't. That uh, our land land hop, our downlink, first downlink is actually in the Philippines. So I was logging into a vendor site the other day, and their fraud detection prohibited me from doing that because it thought I was in the Philippines. Yeah, I noticed that the other day. I had to I logged into my email, and it was like suspicious activity. Someone in the Philippines is trying to log into. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah, what was the name of the app that you and Elsa were using? Yeah, to look at. I think you were looking at constellations. Yeah, specifically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so cool. I have this app called Skyview, oh, okay. and I kind of paid. Well, it's free, but I paid a little bit more because I wanted the full experience and to. I think it was even to use it without uh, Wi-Fi mm -hmm. or like internet. So it's. I highly suggest the app. Uh, it tells me, you can, on the app, you can look up a constellation that you want to see and it will guide you to where it is in the sky. So that's one one of the things I like about it. It also, it's very easy to spot satellites passing yeah. by out here and oh. it'll tell you which satellite it is. Yeah, so on my app too, because I, I think I paid like 99 cents or $2 just to have like, for it to tell me the difference between a satellite and a, and a star constellation. Huh. So last night, on the Scorpio, the Scorpio um, constellation, right at the tail end, where like where the pincher was, was also a um, a satellite. It was I forgot what the name of the satellite was, but yeah, that's the app that I use. Highly recommend it. Skyview. Yeah, it's pretty good. You know, uh, uh, we were talking about. Uh one of Tito's colleagues going up to a space station. Uh, OET, longtime viewers will remember this, has done uh, numerous projects working with NASA and their partners uh, using the ocean as a proxy for the uh, ocean of distant bodies like Europa so that they can develop tools to hopefully explore those areas at some point in the future. Sebastian, could you share a little bit about like when we decide to take a Niskin sample and like what kind of things we look for before we make that decision? Yeah, of course. So whenever we take a Niskin, it's best to take one background sample, which is what the average is what, we look at, what we're looking at. So what we're looking at now is kind of what we would consider background sample for the seamount. So when the previous Fish. watches already took that. Oh. Go for Zoom. Coming in quick. Rat tail. Oh, but it has a parasite. 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 One more quick, and then we'll get out. Coming out slow. Yeah, it's an isopod parasite. So when you say parasite, do you mean that it's harming? Yes. OK. Oh. Yeah, there's a difference between parasite and commensal. All right, that's uh, like a symbiote. Symbi symbi um, symbi both of them are considered symbiosis, but oh. they are uh, parasitism really? is considered a harmful symbiosis. I didn't think it was harmful. It would still be symbiosis. 
Um, that would be um, mutualism, is oh, okay. what you're thinking of. Um, but yeah, so those iPods typically work to either kind of like drain the fish, and some species will actually go into the mouth of the fish, eat the tongue, and become its replacement. It was? Yeah. And then we'll take a bit of every single thing that fish eats for the rest of its life. I don't think I like that. <laughs> it's like, that's like a horror story, yeah. yeah. That's, that's gross. terrifying. That's like, uh, and then it becomes a donut brain or something. <laughs> that, that was your gross fact last, last watch. Maybe it makes it more disease resistant somehow. We don't know. Yeah. I hope you don't bust that out to second grade classes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was an interesting fact. I don't want to scare you away. So, well, the one yesterday wasn't so much that it had a donut-shaped brain, but that if it ate something too big, it could cause brain damage. That it's kind of funny, actually. I, I know the feeling. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's good that our kids aren't designed that way. <laughs> yeah. But yes, continuing your question about um, the Niskin. Oh, yeah. Um, we looked for higher density areas of coral that are different from the background uh, normal distributions we see. Um, Actually, I'm starting to think maybe no, it hasn't like, just quite got there yet. But um, earlier we saw a very, very dense amount of coral in one spot, which is usually an indication of a good spot to take a niskin. But so far we haven't seen another one. Um, but yeah, we're looking for high density coral communities where we can see a lot of eDNA kind of gathered together as one sample. We and seen uh, whips, whip corals yet? This time? Yeah, these, a lot of these are whip corals that I said, yeah, I can't like pronounce it, I said the yeah, day. I didn't remember seeing those earlier. We've there. seen quite a few. Uh, oh, for, uh, Brittle Star. The Brittle Star is yeah. new. And just to, um, just to let our viewers know who may not know, uh, eDNA is like, just kind of like um, cells that are, that are floating in the water column, either dead coral polyps or fecal matter or skin cells or uh, you know the uh, any of that sort of stuff that that you know if you run genetics on we can we can sense the sort of species that are in the in the general area rather than getting genetic information directly from uh, like a coral sample for example so here's the 12:30 a.m. thought I had as I was trying to get oh, I say a uh, sea star predating yeah. on a coral uh, after my roommate got woken up for something. Uh, I wonder if humans at some point will get to a point where they can just go to a uh, an area where an activity has happened and they want to determine like specifically who was there. Mm -hmm. That they could just do a mass collection and filtration of the air in that space. Well, I, I feel like... Um like a fairground, you know, like there's a carnival that they pack up the Ferris wheel and that sort of stuff, and, and the, there's still tracks where people walked. There's yeah. tra there's litter on the ground. There's, uh, you know, people probably peed in the woods, that sort of thing. You know, there, there's traces of human activity um, all over the place, and that's that's you know that's the sort of thing actually that archaeologists Fish. look for. We they uh, often like to. Um, uh, excavate middens or trash piles because it's kind of a, a, a culmination of all of the waste of uh, right. a, a society. Um, so I think that eDNA is kind of a similar uh, subject to that. That's a good that. comparison. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, uh, visual surveys is just one way to try to understand biodiversity of an area, so I think the eDNA is an interesting supplement to that, to see things that might not happen upon just by uh, looking at a small area with a video camera. Yeah. We should remember too that there's things that uh, actively avoid an ROV with the lights and the yep. noise. Um, yeah, the uh, ROVs are not quiet. Well, I guess even an electric vehicle, I think, it's not quiet. We get asked a lot if there's a hydrophone on uh, the ROV, and there's yeah, another fish. Wouldn't hear a thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, you'd hear a lot, but it'd just be the well. The you don't hear the ROV. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can hear it as soon as they give power to her because uh, electric whine. Yeah. If you uh, took uh, six ginormous blenders and put them on the fastest speed and then put your ear up against them, that's about the same sound. Yeah, and that's without even the thrusters going. Yeah, have you ever been in like a lake with uh, boats around and you put your head underwater oh, and yeah. you hear like that yeah. whirring? Yeah. That's that's what you would hear, except imagine being directly next to the boat. Yeah. That's one of the disturbing things about scuba diving is when you do hear a boat, uh, human ears cannot locate where the sound's coming from because it's moving too fast. The sound moves much faster through water than it does through air, and our brains are not tuned to those minor, minor differences in the time the sound arrives to tell you where it's coming from. So one of the um, cool projects that occurred in um, Papahanaumokuakea was with the um, Sanctuary Sound um, project, and they were actually um, put in hydrophones at specific different locations in the monument to kind of assess the um, if whales, if kohola, right. humpback whales were visiting the monument, and um, yes, they were. So there's oh, certain areas that um, were really high in um, whale song, and they were able to um, kind of check out and see that, that these were like breeding and um, calving whales. And so it's a, it's a really cool continuing research to understand if this is a distinct population from the population that normally um, returns to Hawaii, to the main Hawaiian islands. So, you know, kind of um, really amazing research to understand um, the whales that come to this area and the, the areas that they tend to like to be in. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and you said that was, um, they were using a hydrophone? Hydrophones, yep. So they deploy them sure. at specific areas um, in the monument mm -hmm. to kind of assess yeah, and then we also used a wave glider, which is this um, autonomous, it kind of looks like a surfboard. And so they had some hydrophones on board. Um, it's all solar powered, and it basically uses the power of the ocean to um, maneuver it. And that was um, also captured whale song as well. So different methods of kind of um, assessing what's going on in regards to our um, kohola humpback whale populations. I have a question, Ms. Malia. So for the whales, do Hawaiians have like any like special stories related to whales? There is. There are a lot of different stories. Um, we do have Hawaii, um, Kohola. We have Kaipalawa, which are the sperm whales. Um, they are very revered in the Hawaiian culture. Um, their bones actually were used to make very um, to make these um, special types of um, ornaments or um, what's a good word for them because because they were very only for the ali'i so the bones would actually be carved so Hawaiians weren't actively hunting the whales but when the carcasses as we see now in modern times the carcasses will oftentimes um, come up on the shorelines. And so they use that bone um, to create like um, artwork and items that were useful, but then also items that were ceremonial. So um, Hawaiian chiefs actually wore um, these pendants that were made out of the whale bone to signify their rank and their ability to speak on behalf of the gods. So um, whales were like really highly revered in the Hawaiian culture. And then there's other stories too of whales coming to visit, um, bringing people with them, mm. um, with people actually on the whales being carried wow. from other places in the Pacific. So um, yeah, whales are really amazing part of our relationships, those interconnected relationships. and. 
And this is true in other Pacific um, Polynesian cultures as well. Wow. I had a feeling that they, they were something special because I feel like so far looking at the Hawaiian culture, everything has such like power and significance in nature. And I was just curious, because you were talking about the whales being in Papahanaumokuakea. So, I would thank you for You're sharing. Welcome. And there was a really amazing movie made in Aotearoa, um, New Zealand, Whale Rider. It came out like about ooh, 15 years ago. But another great kind of telling, uh, retelling of a, um, a historical narrative of the Maori people. Um, who are indigenous to um, Aotearoa or known as New Zealand as well. So if you get a chance, watch that movie because it retells that powerful story of that connection that humans have with with whales. Wow. Yeah, I'm definitely going to go add it to my watch list right now. Yeah. <laughs> you said whale rider? Whale rider. I'm pretty sure that's the name of the... Um, it was created, uh, produced by a Maori um, filmmaker. Right now, when I put something on my watch list, I also make a note of who recommended it so I can get back to them and give them feedback. Or a nice way to reconnect with someone. So we're redirecting the ship now a little bit and we'll move up towards that spot that we want to look for a rock near waypoint four. We'll awesome. see more vertical here. Yep. Very vertical. Big wall. very top edge of a huge, very steep wall <laughs> drops off to the deep ocean. Uh, oh, what is that? It's a cool rock. Yeah, I've been noticing those those rocks like along the breaks. Yeah, along the um, past of the wave points. Since we've got on. That was the one that I drew because uh, they right. look, yeah, because I, it's pretty fascinating how those ridges happened. Like I said, it looks like pohoi hoi lava flow. Can you give me a reset there? It seems kind of dense here. Do we think we should take an iskin? Uh, we're we're mm. it might change as we get closer to waypoint four in the rock yeah, area. Yeah, but well, but it probably get less if anything. Um, we're in the midst of a move, so we could also wait till that. Can we? Out. Are we capable of doing an iskin while we're moving, or no? I prefer <clears throat> not. Um, I mean. We can do it while we're moving, but we're also on a wall, and yeah. I'm getting blown by current. Gotcha. So okay. No worries. No worries. It's just difficult to yeah, hold position on a wall. Yeah, let's plan to do it around the look for rock point, assuming corals are there. Which way are you getting pushed? Uh, along the ship, along with the ship move, but okay. That's kind of blowing me off the wall too. So, Mike, you started coming out on Nautilus when it was in the Mediterranean, right? Yep, NA001. Nice. Yeah, it was. Uh, we had been using uh, the former control vans as flyaway systems on a couple of vessels the years yeah. previous to that, and then basically used Nautilus as a flyaway system that first year, and they they never moved the vans again. Right. Um, yeah, we, we were running Ethernet cable all across the the ship trying to get things connected. It was a uh, probably the longest Little mobilization start. period I've ever done. Oh wow. 
So with all of your travels, what's your favorite port call city? Uh, Bodrum, Turkey is a really cool place. Nice. Um, it's it's like, so that's where Halicarnassus used to be, uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was, it was in the harbor of Bodrum. There's an amazing underwater archaeology museum. It's where Institute for Nautical Archaeology did uh, has has uh, labs and, and uh, warehouses and, and conducts um, a lot of their excavations of ancient wrecks from. Um, and uh, but you know, in addition to that, it's also a modern city. There's there's tons of like huge like sailing yachts because people people like uh, they just use that port a lot. So there's there's always there's like lots of shops and and uh, the waterfront is gorgeous. Uh, nice. Good food, yeah. Uh, Nautilus spent quite a bit of time there. I think it actually win we, uh, wintered a few years in a, a, a smaller port uh, just around the peninsula from there. Huh. Yeah, Nautilus has spent the off season in some interesting places in Florida, Los Angeles, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, Honolulu, uh, and somewhere else probably at the end of next season. Yeah. So when the season ends, can someone describe like what happens to Nautilus? Like I'm assuming like maintenance for a little bit, anything like that. And then like, does the ship come all the way out of the water? Uh, we have scheduled dry dock, but there there's uh, ship's husbandry and upgrades and projects that we can't do while we're at sea or doing work. We only, uh, in between expeditions, we only have two days in port. So barely enough time to get fuel and food um, Larger ships don't typically come out of the water um, unless there's a just gonna pull us this way. like a maintenance reason. Um, pulling a sailboat okay. is different than uh, so they'll leave Nautilus in the water up. for most of that work unless it's some hull or engine specific stuff. We were in uh, shipyard several years ago and lengthened the vessel. We also put new berthing up forward. That was done in shipyard uh, in dry dock actually. Uh, we're in. We have a dry dock uh, scheduled for the end of next season. That, that's some advanced uh, planning. Yeah. Well, there's uh, cycles. Like every so often, you have to do various things. To yeah, but you have like a specific place scheduled for that already? Uh, I don't know if they have a shipyard scheduled for that. The oh, further you get into the, the Pacific, the more yeah. expensive it gets. I bet it does, yeah. Uh, especially, I mean, we, I think we've had times where we're in shipyard for, you know, a month or two. Oh, wow. Uh, if you're paying a bunch of money every day, that adds up. It's interesting, though, because when we're in, in, uh, when the vessel's out of the water and you go to, uh, go to the vessel or go to lunch or do anything, go to a vendor, you have to go up. It's a lot of scaffolding to get up to the main deck, especially on the larger vessels. Bridge, Nev. I'd like to do a ship move four or five meters, bearing four zero. at 0 0.3 knots, please. Thank you. So now we're moving back over? Trying to oh, pull us now up we're going that way. Okay, yeah. still, that, still that way. I think we're gonna swing out a bit, but then come back around. Okay. I think the current's pushing more to the west than 
Yeah. It's kind of exaggerating our... Facing into it right now. And, you know, four five. I think I'd be hard pressed to pick a favorite port. I liked Kwajalein. Oh yeah, Kwajalein was awesome. Uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico was cool. Yeah, San Juan. Um, I always love San Francisco, but we get a fantastic berth there, right next to the Exploratorium by the ferry terminal. Uh, Pongo Pongo is a cool place in uh, American Samoa. Oh yeah, Apia in Samoa was. Uh, oh yeah, in independent was that Samoa. Very protected area. You could snorkel like yeah. a ten minute walk from the ship. If you're interested, I'm out ahead of the ship pretty far, and I think I could do it. Opportunistic Niskin in this area. Uh, Sebastian, I would say this is a good area for Niskin. It's significantly higher density than generally before. All right. What sample number is this going to be? It's going to be 59. Are these a lot of bamboo whip corals or something um, else? Uh, yes, they're mostly bamboo whip corals and the same bamboos we were seeing or earlier. They appear to be kind of co-dominating this part of the reef. Seems like you're coming up. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it back down. Sure. Thanks for racking so. back. <laughs> Wouldn't want to poke your cameras at you. No. Nope. Hate it when <laughs> that, you know when that happens? We end up with a little tiny blemish on the dome for the rest of the season. <laughs> and it's almost imperceptible. You when can, when what he does what? If you get poked in the eye with a manipulator. Oh yeah. Well you, uh, it makes me think of um, that machine beast in The Incredibles that he ends up having <laughs> it hit itself and it pops right, its own yes. like core out. But for those of us sitting at the video position with our broadcast monitors over here, once you know that there's a blemish there, <laughs> it's all you see for months. This is gonna be Niskin 5, I believe. Yes, 5. Why do you guys go backwards? Habit. Okay, I like starting with one. Plus, it seems like Niskin 3 is out of order right now due to a missing cap. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, they didn't find that? Oops, uh, sorry, wrong side. Can we have bio off, uh, port on, please? Oh, also, we need to be at a lower altitude for this. Yep. Let me just get it set up here. The altitude needed to be like three, Be right? Between two and three, two yeah. And three. So, in hotel cameras, if you turn on. Uh, yep. Uh, and then turn on the port rail cam, please. Thank you. You're welcome. This, these ones in the back, it's like we should put some. Maybe it's on there, some Solus tape. Uh, they're super hard to see. I can't tell at all. Back to favorite ports. I'm going to go with Hobart, Tasmania. Oh. oh, that's cool. I'd love to go there. But Apia and also uh, Nukualufa were uh, amazing places. Where's Nukualufa? Kingdom of Tonga. Oh, cool. Wow. Been there numerous times. Uh, they weren't port calls, but I got to go ashore in uh, the Republic of Kiribati on Nikamaruru and Canton. That was pretty cool. They've already triggered one, right? There we go, Niskin triggered. Yeah, we, is, they've done six, six at the beginning of the dive. That's sample 59. Oh. And I'm going to go back to that other camera configuration. You're looking at the lasers? Yep. Yes. No, no, I was looking at this. Oh. I, I thought it was something. Thanks. <laughs> I 
fist, and I was like, that's rude. It's I a think. monkey fist. Yeah. get a peek of our still camera there on the front porch at the bottom of the frame. Oh yeah. S cylinder down there. This still camera's great. We've already done the ship move to pull us up near that rock sampling area. And okay, so yeah, so we're just kind of hanging out with the ship. So the ship's going to pull us out. We're, we're going to get pulled up there now, and then yeah. uh, there's an all stop, so we should okay. be able to stay there. Yeah, sounds good. Judging by the tether and the auto heading, I think we got a little bit of current above us. Just a little, yeah. <laughs> and uh, like you said, it's coming from the east mostly and heading to the west. I'm trying to see it in the top part of frame there. Oh. Yeah. oh. What is that? Is that a... It's Ooh. more netting. Wow. Is it? Yeah. Looks like it. Go for zoom. Go on in. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like a tarp. Yeah, it does look like a very degraded tarp. Uh, almost looks like coral. Yeah, it, I almost thought it was one of those megaphone sponges. It's trying to fit in. We haven't seen any more, have we? No. Um, Not really since dive one. Uh, King George. Yeah. The Sorry, age 2001. Yeah, marine debris is a huge problem. Um, even though we don't have a permanent population in Papahanaumokuakea, the um, human impacts to the islands and the atolls are huge. The last um, marine debris group that went out gathered over 82,000 pounds wow. of derelict fishing nets and uh, marine debris that gathers along the coastline. So this is a huge problem that, you know, for entanglement and smothering of the um, coral reefs. Sea star. Mm -hmm. And was that the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Debris Project? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I saw pictures on Instagram of like all of it, and it just like blew me away how massive some of those nets are. Right. We used to. Well, no one used to send um, people out, but now we kind of contract out with the Marine Debris Project, and they've been doing an, a phenomenal job of of getting up there three to four times a year to the different. Um, islands and atolls and they work so hard you know these young people are in the water free diving these are heavy heavy nets you know and they're dangerous so they're actually free diving down cutting the nets um, making them into manageable sizes that they can actually drag and pull up onto the um, the ships that they the ship that they're using and you know I just give them so much props Papahanaumokuakea Marine Debris Project, James Morioka, Kevin O'Brien, and their team just doing amazing work to, um, you know, help remove some of this uh, derelict fishing gear. Molly, what, uh, what, where does that go? Like, are there landfills in Hawaii, or do they, like, ship it off? Um, no, elsewhere? a lot of it gets burned. So we have the H power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, over on Oahu, so the, the majority of it, well, the yeah. nets yeah. Yeah. will get Shipping burned stuff? for okay. energy. Yeah, it makes sense. That's cool. We're in our rock zo searching zone here. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to look, but I can't tell if these rocks are attached or not. Yeah, it's kind of a lot of sediment. Of the, yes, because of the sediment. We can keep our eyes peeled and yeah. slowly move around. Just pan around. 
you know, if we do like 0.1 or 0.2 knots, we'll be able to stop at Shrimp. Less, more of a moment's notice. Shrimp. Like these down here, I don't know. I can't really tell. Actually, I, I don't think. I think they're. Yeah, I think those have rolled down. Yeah. And there's like that one. Yeah, we might have better luck once we're up at waypoint four, which is kind of on a on a rise. Yeah. I'm just I'm gonna keep watching though. Maybe something attached to this outcrop. Mm -hmm. Or associated with. I also don't want to like land on a coral trying to get. Right. Cause I. Looks like we're coming up on sort of a more flat bench on this top of this ridge here. Okay. Sounds like the jet pump's working harder than normal. Does it? To me, but... It shouldn't be. We're directly into the wind okay. and waves. I'm looking over here. Still not really seeing any over here. Maybe. Well, I can't. I can't tell still if some of these rocks are connected with the flow or not. I can. I can poke around. Okay. If so, I guess try to poke around, like, like that rock. Okay. This one. Those ones look like they may be out. I yeah. That's. I was like. Uh, I think it's definitely That's stuck. The right size. I can see oh, yeah, and that one too. If that is possible. That one looks loose. I hope. has been foiled once before, so she's yeah. sensitive to rocks not yeah. moving as she wants. <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty loose. I hope. Not really part of any structure there. If you look at that one to the right of the lasers. Yeah, yeah that blocky one. Yeah. There's this one too. That oh, I, like I know, I know, I know. Yeah. But just in case, I have a backup. Yeah. Oh, do you want it? Let's see it. Yeah. That's bigger than I thought. Down lights. Down lights. Please. They are on. They are on. Oh. Thank this you for is the, also the dark. zoom. I'm gonna blow out the background just so you can see the rock <gasps> a little better. Thank you. Yeah, this one looks good to me. All right. Where are we putting it? Um. Uh, you can put it anywhere but starboard box A. I prefer one of the smaller somewhere in starboard box. Okay, that can be done. Hawaii. Where's it? Thank you. Starboard box. Um, E. Firing sample.
What sample number is this? This is sample number 60. Thank you. You said E? Yes, please. Any other better description for me than that for 15 Sample centimeter angular black rock? Pillow rock. Pillow, Pillow rock. Lava. It's funny, we got that rock pretty much and exactly at the, dive. at the look for rock point. Yay! <laughs> um, Now, if Derek could just put his cursor where the octopus is, that would be helpful. <laughs> that would be a good get. So, Hannah, we, as we collect that rock sample, I'm just thinking about, like, how long has that rock been sitting down here at the bottom of the seafloor, and what all are we going to learn from it after it comes up? So, hopefully, if we're going off of Val's, description saying that it is from the Cretaceous, so the time of the dinosaurs, 100 to 80 million years ago. We're hoping that it'll tell us more about how the mantle was interacting with the plume or how that started and where exactly is this magma flow like compo composed of. Mm -hmm. So looking at the minerals can tell us, first of all, where, like what time they were formed and they can also tell us how and from where what's our, what's our <laughs> in the objective? mantle. Next uh, waypoint. So, because okay. there is a lot, because so one of the things that Dr. Vallis explained to me is that the Hawaiian hotspot is an anomaly compared to other hotspots, mm -hmm. but the Hawaiian hotspot, because of how easily accessible it is, we're able to do a lot of research on it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully looking at these seamounts from the Cretaceous during this time, we'll be able to have a more clear picture of how that hotspot interacted with the plates and with, yeah, checking out like the plate movement, how it moved through time during the Cretaceous. Because during the Cretaceous, there was actually two global repositioning events which is basically tectonic plates moving. And to have two of them during this time was is pretty significant. So right now, they believe that the global plate repositioning event occurred in the Indian Ocean, started in the Indian Ocean. But there could, I know that one of Dr. Conrad's students is working on if the global plate repositioning event actually occurred during the Cretaceous by the Pacific Ocean and the Pacific plates. So that, and looking at the ages of these rocks, just like we do at the Hawaiian hotspot, we can track the plate mov movement through time. So the Hawaiian hotspot actually, if you can tell, it has a bend in it towards the more further away you go from the Hawaiian island, Hilo, where, well, not, it's not called Hilo, but like Hilo where the volcanoes are and they're currently active. So there was a there was a shift in the plate tectonic movement around 50 million years ago, and we were able to reconstruct those plate tecton the plates plate movement during that time and why it changed direction like that. So that was a long answer to no to your that question. was great and I think I have like Ready again Derek what was the ship move that had bearing uh, bearing. Three five zero. Three five zero. Okay. So, Hannah, so are we going to track a line over to waypoint five? Uh, we're getting. We're going to first just go yes, but uh, we're going to the. We're going across this kind of saddle. Yeah. Okay. This flat area, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to keep the current in mind, so I'm okay. trying yep, to stay on the good. right a bit. Okay. Thanks. So, Hannah, where does that bend occur? So it occurs. I wish I had a, a map. Uh, it's, it's really noticeable. Uh -huh. It's really noticeable. And 
it is so there's I don't know it's where it becomes the Emperor Seamount, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's called, this is really called the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. But you can see in the photo that Tori has of just like the Pacific Ocean now, you can see where the okay, change so was. Yeah, it, it goes past it. where okay. we are, and then it kind of goes direct, almost directly north-south and connects up to... Um, the Aleutian the Island chain. Yes. Got it. Is it still within Papahanaumokuakea, or is that bend occurring outside of the... It's, out, it's, out, it, it's outside of the monument. Okay. okay. Quite, quite a bit outside, I think. Okay. I was looking at your screen, Tori, and it says like 47 million years ago, so yeah, it was probably around like 50 to 40, 48, 47. Okay, and earlier you were uh, mentioning how the plates were moving, and mm -hmm. you said, was it the global or the great transition? So what you call it? It was, it's called the GPRE, so Global Plate Repositioning Event. Global Plate Repositioning Event. Interesting. So, so much was going on during the Cretaceous between dinosaurs, the meteor, all these. Un un ancient sea mounts, underwater sea mounts. It was just, and large igneous provinces, which if you think about a sea mount, but like time, like max, like massive. Like you can see it on those photos right there. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that you're clicked on, right where that bend is, where you see that, that yes, that is called the Hess Rise, which is a large igneous province. And that was formed, that actually doesn't have a lot of ages either because it's so hard to get to the Hess Rise because the waters are so rough, which is wow. kind of what I expected when we were, were kind of like far out. So I thought that it would, this would have been a rougher, yeah. rougher cruise. And was that named after, was that named after Henry Hess? I have no, no idea. Let's find out. I have no idea, but so the Hess Rise, it has a few different ages. I think that places it around like, a hundred and something million years ago. I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, not a lot of research has been done on the Hess Rise since the, since the nineties. Is it because it's in that latitude of the, like the forties? It's kind of like those, oh, there's a name for it. Like it's this crazy kind of weather yes. patterns. Yes. It's, um, I've just, I've heard that it's, it's rough. And getting samples there is really hard. Yeah, we've been so lucky. We've had such beautiful conditions in Papahanaumokuakea. I heard it's pretty wild during the winter up here, though. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tried that once. <laughs> yeah. You know, the waves get this big. <sighs> That's fun. I would definitely be seasick. <laughs> Do you remember how many di dives we got on that leg, Derek? It was only like six or seven, I think. It was not many. What Derek. time of the year were you out here, Ed? <laughs> like January or February. Oh. Yeah, I think that was a tough one. I wasn't on that particular cruise. Oh, uh, you weren't? Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, oh, maybe that's Daniel was with us. Yeah, I was out. I was out there in March one year. Yeah, yeah it was, was an all-time uh, low. I think the weather filled Yeah, yeah. I think I heard Daniel chiming in there. Off the line. <laughs> He's back in the interaction oh. room. So that was uh, important work, and I think some of that data was helpful in uh, uh, justifying the expansion of the monument. Yeah, I can I can attest to that. It was actually the timing of that cruise was exactly timed perfectly because it was right before a lot of the conversation about the expansion started to yeah. take off. And uh, yeah, it was very surreal. I think six months later, Obama came to Hawaii. And it's all done. And actually, when we when we finished that uh, 
crews, there was a group from the Council of Environmental Quality coming. Uh, they basically met us almost at the dock and, and wanted to know about what we had found. Oh, that's awesome. It's exciting when it's that uh, relevant to management, the work we're doing. Daniel, can you maybe introduce yourself, just because I know some, some people might not know that you just jumped on the line. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Uh, so I'm Daniel Wagner, uh, Chief Scientist for the Ocean Exploration Trust. And uh, uh, yeah, previously prior to joining the Ocean Exploration Trust, I had the uh, privilege of also working for the Papahanaumokuake Marine National Monument. And had, uh, they had the privilege of going to uh, a lot of these expeditions and uh, yeah, seeing the, the shallow reefs and then the mesophotic reefs. and. Uh, sequentially got to go on some of more deeper voyages and yeah the deeper we go these find deeper ecosystems but still some really remarkable ones and uh, yeah the interesting thing is you know we talk about that expedition being a, a important for the monument expansion and now we are in this uh, sanctuary designation and yeah this is really the first crews that are going to that northwestern end of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Prior to this cruise, there was this big gap that we're trying to fill. And we've already shown that there's some really remarkable cultural and natural resources in this area. It's so good to, to um, share that with our, um, with our viewers. You know, those, those kind of tangible um, impacts that research has and the, the significance of the research in protecting these kind of large marine protected areas. So, mahalo nui, Daniel. So as Daniel was mentioning, this is a sacred um, area. It is um, Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, the largest marine protected area um, in the United States at over 582,000 square miles of ocean and um, 10 emergent um, islands and atolls. Brittle. We are also a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, which is actually the first. We are a natural and cultural mixed, natural and cultural site in the whole of the United States. And um, significantly, only 3% of all UNESCO um, heritage sites carry this special designation as a mixed natural and cultural site. So um, Papahanaumokuakea is very special on multiple levels. So for size reference, uh, if we were to put the extent of the monument on the contiguous United States, do you have a sense of what states would stretch between? Like, uh, Lar well, it is larger than the Gulf of Mexico. And if, we, if any of you are national park visitors who love our beautiful national parks, it is larger than all of the national parks in the wow. United States. That's something to think about. <laughs> Impressive. Combined, right? Combined, all yeah. of the national parks combined. Yep. Wow. One of our former video engineers, Mary Nichols, who's spent decades working on uh, projects with Dr. Ballard, uh, is now re fully retired and uh, spends a good amount of time knocking out her list of national parks. A little scamp trailer. That sounds Played like fun. A key role in imaging so many great things that OET is known for. Go for zoom in here, Ed. Yeah, Is coming in. Sponge. A whole bunch of here. I, I got I confused myself. I was watching the still camera screen, and I'm like, it's not zooming. Yeah. But we're not. We don't zoom on that one. I've had times, especially if I have to stand double watches, where I'll be here. I'm like, why aren't they zooming on that organism? They should totally zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like this Walteria sponge is covered in ophioroids and a small crinoid. 
I'm not really used to seeing ophiolites on glass sponges, though, so it's a little unusual. That's a sponge? Yeah. It looks like a coral. It, is it a coral? It looks like a Walteria uh, sponge to me. I can do a full zoom. Yeah. yeah. You okay with that? Yeah. Jake? Yeah, go for it. Coming all the way in. Try not to bounce. Oh, it is a coral, is it? No, yeah. I mean, it oh, looks yeah. like polyps on it, right? Yeah, it's coral. It's coral. Squirrel? Squirrel? Coming out. Uh, that's a cool one. It is a cool one. It has like a sponge shape. I feel like a lot of the sponges yeah, I've been it's looking at look like that, so I'm confused. It's <laughs> a good observation. Can we get a zoom on that plate-like sponge right there in front of you? This one? Yes. Right below the, no, right below the light right now. Oh. Uh, right below the lasers? The lasers, yeah. Oh, the lasers. I'm saying laser, lights instead of lasers. Yeah, very different. <laughs> Go for zoom. Go on in. Oh, you said sponge, never mind. Yeah. Oh. There it is. Keeping. I can't tell. All right, thank you. Here. Oh, we're good. Right. Oh, nice. Current's been blowing me off, so I'm just going to come back in front. Uh, just going to step out for a sec. Be right back. This is where we bypass the uh, shipwreck and the treasure chest while Mike's gone. Hannah, you're still here though, right? Yeah. Your uh, passion and excitement for your field is uh, off the charts. I feel like if I asked Aww. you what you did somewhere, I would leave an hour later with an associate's degree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that means really a lot. I love what you're doing. I, I really do. It's so much fun. I have a feeling that no matter where I would have ended up in geology, I would have been equally as passionate about. Seems we're in an area now seems to be co-dominated by the primnoids and these um, whip corals. So I would see a lot less of those um, bamboo coral fans. Hannah, could you share a little bit about like what other uh, parts of geology you were maybe interested in studying? Yeah. So when I was an undergrad, I jumped around like different projects. So my freshman year, I was working with in more of a planetary science. So I was looking at, I wanted to understand the subsurface of Mars. Mm -hmm. So how 
because on Earth there's a core, mantle, crust, like the, those different layers, and I really wanted to try to understand the different layers of Mars, like if it was similar to Earth or what have you. And I guess during around that time, NASA or they haven't they hadn't sent anything for like seismology because you usually use seismology to determine what's um, Go for zoom here, Ed. going on. Like no, this is core a spark, mantle right? just crust. Yeah, this is definitely Walteria. Uh, it has a ophiroid, a crinoid, and it looks like a commensal shrimp. Yeah. I believe that is a different species of white crab inside. behind it. Can I go full in? Yeah, go full in. Just real quick. Okay, coming out. Right. We'll get this crab. Yep. Yeah, uh, there we go. It looks non-symmetrical. Missing something. I count seven. Yeah. Seven legs. Uh, maybe there's one hidden under the front. No. Nope. I think it's gone. Maybe it's. Or is that that little one up front? Maybe yeah. Yeah, I can see it. It looks yeah. like a little shrimp. Yep. Coming out. On our way. But yeah, so I worked on I worked on that, and then I switched to an Art in my sophomore year in an Arctic Antarctica project that was looking at the Ross Ooh. Sea and the retreating glaciers and how that affects the benthic organisms or the sediment on the ground where the ice sheet um, like melts away. So I was actually supposed to go to Antarctica nice in 2020, wow. 2019, Street but Dr. COVID down. happened, so then that was canceled. Ice macro movie. Um, so then I switched back to another back lab. Watch these not here right now. Oh. Wait. I switched to another How lab. How fast are we going? 0 0.3. I switched. <laughs> So it's true, another lab that uh, looked at sedimentation rates of the Indus River in the Himalayas. So that was like my last project wow. that I worked on. Um, any chance we can pull a NISC in here? Yeah, want to just stop the ship here or above Baby these? What? Yeah, uh, like along this wall or on the... on the um, Closer to the seafloor, please. Closer to the seafloor. But I knew after I worked with the sedimentology, like that type of stuff, I really wanted to try igneous rocks, hard rocks. So that's what led me to seamounts. And when I read about them on my advisor's page, I was completely like, I was like, what? Like, didn't, didn't even know about the extent of how much we didn't know about these sea mounts on, in the Pacific Ocean. Right. And was that you reading on your advisor's page like while you were applying for grad school, trying to figure out where you wanted to go, what you wanted to study? Yes. So I basically went through each state and I read, and I looked at their colleges and I read all their like faculty pages and yeah, Dr. Balvis, which is who's my, who my advisor is, she, yep. her page stood yep. out to me. and. Yeah, quick. I was like, absolutely. Also, I just, I, I did, I wanted to work with a woman in STEM just because all my advisors at Sebastian. LSU, who I love, they were all Sebastian, males. Sebastian, Niskin bottle? So um, Niskin bottle four, please. collaborate with a woman and just see what that was like and what her experience has been like as a, a woman in the geology field because there are not a lot of women in geology. Yeah. So that mentorship is really important, and I'm glad mm -hmm. you found that. It yeah. sounds like every time I've asked you about your experience there, it's like just so excited, and yeah. I'm curious though, like you. Full, full wide. Definitely are a person that like takes advantages of opportunities and find them. Do you have recommendations for students that might be an undergrad to like? Yeah. How can you explore options and get involved with things? So as an undergrad, it was really important for me to tried to build any experience because we again, do uh, bio off port on please 
because again, everything in geology just sounded so cool that I was like, okay, I need to start like figuring out which one I really Thank love. You. You're welcome. So, um, what I did, I was... Four. Oh, well, I think I three think we just three. pulled three. Three's I think tricky. three yeah, is the one that does not have a cap right yeah, now. Yeah, we don't think it works. Yeah, it's missing one of the three, caps. Three, three doesn't have a cap. You said? On yeah. The bottom, I or we somewhere. We fixed that. We we. we oh, we, you fixed yeah, it. Yeah, there's a new vent plug in there. Oh, okay. Well, then we can just count that one as three then. Um, that would be sample zero sixty one. Did we did we see? All right, I'm getting oh, a big difference here. Yeah, we did. Okay. But. Yeah, so I would highly, so one of the things that my freshman year, my first semester introduction to geology class, my professor was saying how, you know, reach out to the pr other professors in this department, any of them that sound really cool to you, and just email them and see if you can help on any other projects. And I was really nervous about reaching out to any of these professors because I, this was, my first semester and I was like I don't know if like I'm not because I don't know anything right because I was like I have no experience in this so I reached out to at the time it was Dr. Siniti and we uh oh sorry just my mom texted me and she was like they've been watching since we started and she's like signing off because the LSU game is coming on and I was just like I'm just laughing at it because. Oh, you got Trump by yeah, LSU game. Yeah, I got LSU. Oh, oh, wow. got Trump by an LSU game. So, <laughs> but yeah. So talking with um my professors and then making the jump to like email them and them responding back so like happy for me to like they wanted me, wanted to help me and wanted me to like get experience. So I was really thankful for my professor giving us the like the students the confidence to reach out to other yeah, like other professors in the department. That's really good advice and something that I feel like a lot of people, um, especially starting undergrad or first semester, if you like don't know that mm -hmm. that's something you're allowed to do, like mm -hmm. um, that's really cool that y'all yeah. were yeah. encouraged to do that and so many connections were made. It you really does take you initiative you and uh, jumping out there under. if you're passionate about something or really want to explore yeah, I'll come, it i'll come back under taking like, the ooh, keep time the the to do that um when i was growing up in philadelphia the high school i selected i selected because they had a uh, television club now this is half inch black and white reel-to-reel -reel recorders uh, but still it existed Unfortunately, it was defunct because there was not a faculty advisor. But still, I selected it as my high school. And then as an incoming freshman, knowing nothing, I called the school and asked them, what date do teachers report for the start of school year? And it was a week or two before school started. And I was there that day and helped teachers unload boxes and went to every classroom and talked to every teacher until I had recruited somebody to moderate that club and resurrect it. Uh, and it's just, you know, you have to really want something to, and then just push and think about how you can pursue that path um, Absolutely. and be persistent. You know, you, you hate to bug people, but it works. Mm -hmm. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> yeah, I, I have, uh, I tell, People want to come out here as contractors and work. You know, it's uh, Bob, here's when we're going to be staffing. And I have one person who I tell that to, and they're like, okay, great. So I hear you saying this quarter, I'll call you on October 5th. And this is like in January or something. And then on J October 5th, they call me. Yeah. They say, any word yet on your contractor positions for this year? I was like, you know, it's going to take me another three weeks. I'm like, great, I'll call you on the 28th. And, you know, just that persistent follow up. Yeah. Uh, It, you can't be super passive about your own future. Mm -hmm. I really hope that right. some of my students are on we'll here. We'll approach the bottom of about 25 that. meters off. Start coming down. Watch that. Tori, how did you know that you wanted to become a teacher? Um, so I'll be honest. I've had 
Like so many of my family members are teachers and I would just have so much fun like going to visit schools of my family members when I was young. Um, we, my family lived all over because my dad was in the army, but like when we lived close by uh, to, and I'm from North Carolina, um, all of my family were Lumbee, were from Robeson County and Fayetteville, North Carolina is only like 30 minutes from home. So my schools there were year round. So when I would be tracked out, I would have weeks at a time off and I would just go hang out at my aunt's school. And literally wow. just like, I'd be in like first grade sitting in her fourth grade class being like, I'm fourth grade today. <laughs> and as I got older, it would also just be fun to like go back and just like hang out. And I've had like a lot of other family members teach like different grades. So like I kind of grew up being told like, you'd be a good teacher, good elementary school teacher. And then I got older and I was like, I don't think I'm gonna teach elementary school. <laughs> and then I started playing in the orchestra and for a while I was like, I could be an orchestra teacher. Cause I just, loved my orchestra class and my orchestra teacher and then I took chemistry in high school and yeah, changed your life yeah and this whole time I also was like loving all things ocean and like I showed my students right before I left I had an assignment my freshman year of high school that was kind of like uh, your future answer mm -hmm. these questions about what you think your future is going to look like That's and the so entire fun. thing was like marine science marine biology like I don't think I had realized still at that age, that was what I was like very firmly saying, like this is what I wanted to do. I was gonna go to like UNCW and major in marine biology. Like I kind of had a whole plan, but I was living in Alabama at the time. So I was, I don't know, it was just kind of a hard uh, thing for me to picture myself kind of like getting back there. Um, and then I think that I had some experiences later on in high school where I moved around to a few different, um, I, what's our course over ground? Um, moved to a new high school uh, my junior year. On three, four, zero. And just kind of noticed a lot of things about the international baccalaureate, the IB program that I was in, and just kind of the representation of students at the school and the lack of representation in those higher level classes. And I started to get kind of very passionate about being like, is no one else noticing this? Like, this is not a great feeling as a student, but also like, there are so many kids in this building who have like no idea this exists. And then I got like yeah. really passionate about trying to like kind of fix that while I was there. And then I was like, you know what? I've always wanted to also be a teacher. And I knew I wanted to do something like science related. And I also like didn't get to finish taking the two year IB chemistry class. So I kind of went into college being like, I didn't get to finish chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted more chemistry. And so I majored in chemistry, secondary ed. Now I can teach. Um, all high school sciences, but I also, like I've told you, I took like my intro geology class, the one credit I needed, like my junior year of college, and I was like, this is awesome, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And then COVID happened, <laughs> so oh, it was yeah. like, not really a lot of time before I was like, one, I'm about to be a teacher, but also like, I'm having so much fun learning about geology, like I was trying to figure out how to like feed that excitement. Um, Geology 101 was actually one of the last Four classes I took there. because yeah. it was like, I'd taken a bunch of other ones just like on the side and then added the major and it was required for the major and they're like, you have to take 101. I was like, really? <laughs> they're like, yeah, we can't really waive it. I was like, okay, because they're taking everything that it was a prereq for, but they'd waived that. Um, and I was just like, this class is still awesome. <laughs> I know. I honestly like a lot of the stuff that I teach in my earth science class, I don't remember ever learning it in like school when I was younger. Yeah, like it wasn't until don't. that geology class where I was like, you know what? I've actually never learned about like volcanoes and earthquakes. Like I remember plate tectonics, but like I never remember learning about like plate boundaries and like Different even just like rocks. Yeah, and so then like, um, I remember specifically like learning how um, we use like seismology and like those sound waves from earthquakes to like figure out like the interior of the earth and like mm -hmm. liquid or solid. Like I was just sitting there being like, that is so cool because I was like, I had never thought about like, how do we know this? Like yeah. what is inside the earth? We haven't dug that far down. Like how do we find this information? And um, yeah, I'm not teaching chemistry right now. And I think that was something at first I was very like kind of sad about, but like I love teaching earth science. And I think it's like, so important and the like our lithosphere unit is very small but like any teachers on here that teach earth science the plate tectonics module on the nautilus live website like it's so much fun like i completely scrapped everything i was doing once i found it and my kids loved it maybe i'll try it <laughs> you should it's I amazing i 
love that. There's like a little lab with like graham crackers to introduce them to like the plate boundaries. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, and it was something where before like any kind of food thing, you know, students get excited right about. Something you purple. Are. Oh. Looks like a cucumber. Yeah. We're chasing it. Um, so speaking of plate boundaries, uh, when I did my uh, comprehensive exams uh, for grad school, um, you have to do written ones and then oral ones. So you, each professor gives you like a written thing that you have a certain amount of time to do. And then as a group, your committee asks you Don't questions. It's really stressful, blah, blah. Um, for, but for the written one, uh, Dr. Ballard gave a, he, he did this for all of us, but we weren't allowed to tell future students what his question mm -hmm. was. Uh, but he doesn't have students anymore, so I can share it. Um, so he, he just gave us a piece, uh, it was like one pa pa piece of paper, uh, and then he gave us this giant roll of paper and tape and navigational instruments and pencils and stuff. And he, sa he gave us a list of coordinates of different cities in the, in the world and said, step one, draw a lat long grid on this piece of paper for the whole earth. Step two, plot all of these cities. Step three, sketch all the continents. Step four, sketch all the plate boundaries from wow. memory. Ah. And I had not known to study that, but thankfully I've looked at maps of, like ocean maps of the world for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, like I had one in my room when I was like in high school, because, yeah, <laughs> because, just because. Um, and so I actually did pretty well. I didn't get the East Pacific Rise Junction all that well. And I did not get the shape of South America at all. I don't know. It looked, it kind of looked like a mini Africa. I don't know. I got like it, I don't know. I could, I probably still can't sketch it today. But everything else was decent. And, and the, the cool thing about the question though, is that assuming you could get the lat long grid right, um, he gave you enough cities to be able to picture where the continents were. So like, you know, you had like Anchorage and you had uh, Paris and you had like Cape Town so you, it was enough scatter that you're like okay well I can visualize that the end of S S Africa's here and the end of uh, South America's here so we, it was like points were for reference um, it was actually it was really fun I wish I could I wish I could do it well, I probably could do it on my own but like I wish that it hadn't been part of the comprehensive exams because it was just so stressful I was like I need to finish I need to finish rather than not sitting down and actually enjoying it because uh, right. it's actually kind of a cool thing to do. Um, but then sketching the mid-ocean ridges uh, and, la and labeling them, that was, uh, I was like, oh, I haven't thought about these in a while. That's um, cool. But yeah, it was, a, it was a cool exercise. Wow. I would have freaked out if you pulled, <laughs> pulled that out. <laughs> and then I would have been like, oh, <laughs> shocked. Yeah. It's interesting there's uh so many different ways to try and uh, visualize the earth on a two-dimensional flat piece of paper yeah uh, that's all true. different types of projections that that accomplish that but one of the really interesting ways to look at the planet i think it's called the spillhouse spielhouse projection which is ocean centric it's a square oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. representation and uh, a little plug for our friends at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. They have an awesome shirt with that projection on it. Oh, that'd be cool. I'd like that. And it says, uh, change your perspective underneath it. Uh, yeah, I saw something on that, like that on Facebook the other day. It was like the world from the f from a fish's perspective and yeah. it had all the continents as like the edges. The boundary, yeah. yeah. I like that. Really shows the ocean as one ocean and not um, seven oceans. Is it seven oceans? Anyway. Sebastian, what are we seeing here? Um, I believe this is a dead Walteria sponge. Um, we're seeing a couple of ophiorides inhabiting it, but you can really tell that it's kind of dead due to its coloration, and you can tell like there's a lack of, you know, other tissues, and mostly just leaving behind that glassy skeleton. Sorry to interrupt you guys. I was just curious no, what good. that was. No, you're fine. That was probably a good question. Cause, yeah. Other um, people are probably wondering that too. Tori, uh, was your dad at Fort Bragg? Tori? Yes, we would go home pretty often to Fort Bragg because that's yeah. about like 30 minutes away from like home home. So I lived there like I think two or three times. I did a stint there at the 82nd Airborne Corps mm -hmm. Support Command. Oh, yeah, he was in the 82nd. Long time ago. 
Yes. I was there in like 86 or That's where I use this reference for people to try and explain where like my family's from. Um, so were you familiar with Lumberton at all? No. No? I was familiar with Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. I, I was just there writing for the newspaper for a little mm -hmm. bit.